Good. We're all here. Gentlemen, I give you the future. In three... Two... One. Time for the fireworks. Kept you waiting. It's amazing how a gaming franchise, this piece of interactive art, was so beloved for a period of time, and due to its extended absence, an entirely new generation of gamers have no idea why it mattered. But we remember, don't we? Double Agent is the fourth game released in the Splinter Cell franchise and was developed by Ubisoft Shanghai plus Ubisoft Milan and was released in 2006 on the Xbox 360, with a Windows version later that year, as well as a PlayStation 3 release in 2007. Double Agent follows the triumphant third game in the series, Chaos Theory. At the time, the seventh generation version of the game was where most of the attention was focused, but there was also a second version of Double Agent. Despite my love for Splinter Cell, I never played version 2 of Double Agent, released for the original Xbox, PlayStation 2, and Wii around the same time as version 1. I was vaguely aware of it, but had always just assumed it was a pared down version of what was then the very flashy next-gen edition on the Xbox 360. It wasn't until recently that I read deeper into version 2 and was pleasantly surprised to find that it was not only developed by Ubisoft Montreal, the same developer behind Chaos Theory, but that it was, in essence, an extension of the foundation set by Chaos Theory, using the same graphics engine and gameplay format established by the third Splinter Cell. This means that there are, in effect, two different versions of Splinter Cell Double Agent, both with their merits and flaws. Now, why two versions? Well, the concept of a company publishing a previous and next generation version of a game was certainly nothing new, and, especially during those days, the generational differences between games was much more pronounced. It's a way to capitalize on the already established home console base while producing something for the new consoles as well, to maximize profit. Basic business. But what caused production of an almost completely different version of the same game? Ubisoft Shanghai, as they had done with Splinter Cell 2, known as Pandora Tomorrow, began to develop Double Agent during the development cycle of Chaos Theory. Once Chaos Theory wrapped, several Montreal team members such as Clint Hawking, the game's director, moved on to other projects or broke off to form entirely different studios for other publishers. The remaining team in Montreal was tasked with creating the sixth generation version of Double Agent in a little over a year. Due to limited resources, chief among them being time, the last gen versions of Double Agent feel more like an extension of the third game, and why many in the community refer to it affectionately as Chaos Theory 2. For the purposes of this review, I played the Xbox 360 version running with Series XS enhancements. 
I will refer to this version of Double Agent as version 1, as this is common nomenclature. The sixth generation version, which I played the original Xbox copy of running on backwards compatibility software, will be referred to as version 2. Easy peasy. For this uncommon double review, I'll be altering my usual format a bit by discussing similarities and differences along the way, so as to keep this review as seamless as possible. The genesis of hypertension films centered around the first three Splinter Cell games, and I knew that, eventually, the time would come to continuing honoring its legacy. Well, the time is right, and here we are. You really are the most devious bastard in New York City. The basic story of Double Agent remains the same across both versions. Our protagonist, Sam Fisher, is on assignment to scout for intelligence at a geothermal plant in Iceland. At the conclusion of the mission, Sam is informed by his handler, Irving Lambert, that his daughter, Sarah, has been killed by a drunk driver while she was apparently walking alone through a dark alleyway. Naturally, Fisher doesn't receive the news well and takes a dark path of self-destructive behavior. Instead of offering him support with resources for healthy coping strategies, Lambert has Fisher run deep undercover as a non-official covered operative, or NOC, in order to help him manage the trauma of his daughter's death. The NSA places Sam at the site of three armed robberies around the nation to help establish his cover, and then has him sent to Ellsworth Prison in Arkansas to get close to a member of a group of domestic insurrectionists known as John Brown's Army, or JBA named after the American abolitionist of the same name. Because nothing says cope like infiltrating a gang of madmen. <laughs> so this is my first problem with the plot of Double Agent. Was the death of Sarah Fisher really necessary? Necessary? I appreciate a good emotional flashbang in a story as much as anyone, but Sarah dying just isn't that effective. Her character was prominent and established in the early Raymond Benson books, which is great, but not many people picking up this game would have read the supplemental material, nor should they have to. Therefore, her death in Double Agent comes off as a cheap shock moment meant to force empathy from the player, and again, it was completely unnecessary. Necessary? Sarah's passing is never brought up again and you never see Sam grapple with the emotional burden of losing his child. The game could have started with Sam being hired on as a knock, as he's the only man that Lambert trusts enough for this assignment. Something to that effect. And it would have had the same outcome. In version 1, the story is told in the present tense, and you follow along with Fisher and the JBA as they go along. In version 2, the tale is told as a series of flashbacks, with Fisher being on a phone call with NSA Assistant Director Lawrence Williams after Fisher has gone rogue from the NSA following his assignment. From here on out, I'd like to format the review on a level-by-level -level basis to streamline the comparisons and create a sort of narrative synthesis. The storytelling timeline is really only the beginning. You might say, the tip of the iceberg. Both games open with a level set in Iceland. In version 1, Sam is tasked with infiltrating a geothermal plant with his rookie partner, John Hodge. The two dive out of the Osprey and into the frigid waters below. It's here where we see swimming introduced, a relatively small but quaint addition to the Splinter Cell formula. The controls are smooth enough, and Shanghai had the good sense to keep swimming sections brief and without any unnecessary aquatic objectives. This is also where Sam can perform the new and very slick icebreak execution, where he snatches an enemy from under a sheet of ice, drags him down, and finishes the sentry off with a plunge through the sternum. Very flashy, and a nice evolution from grabbing enemies behind paper walls in Chaos Theory, although you can still do that at a few points in here. Version 1's Iceland is absolutely gorgeous. The deep lavender night sky lined with clouds, punctuated with the beaming glow from the moon, is still quite lovely. 
In contrast to the dark, inky nightscape of version 1's Iceland, version 2 begins under the bright orange glow of the setting sun. This is interesting considering how version 1 changes over to predominantly well-lit maps, while version 2 quickly reverts back to the comfort of shadow and darkness. In version 2, this level begins with Sam and his partner, Hisham Hamza, descending down the side of a large frozen rock face. Similar to version 1, the duo must infiltrate a factory to gather intel and plant spy equipment for surveillance. Sam can issue basic co-op commands such as wait here or follow me, and can perform similar boosting moves like in version 1. Though beyond this point, unless it was necessary, I really never used any of this stuff. Sam and Hisham sneak through ice caves, leading to Sam's ability to snatch enemies through thinning layers of ice, like the ice grab in version 1. It's more or less a set-piece gimmick move, and not something you'll use often, but it's pretty cool. Though I must say, version 1's underwater ice grab is far superior in terms of pure style. Sam can still access traditional med kits in this version, and he still makes pleasurable noises. In version 1, however, Shanghai implemented a regenerating health system, noted by a little shield on your HUD that flashes when Sam takes damage. I suppose because Call of Duty 2 was the rage of its time, this was to be expected, but it never really matters either way in either version. For obvious reasons, version 2 could never look as shiny or as crisp as its next generation counterpart, and certainly facial animations are a little dated. Be that as it may, the use of light and warm black shadows are still beautiful on the modified Unreal 2 engine, and make a compelling argument for use of lighting as far more artistic and timeless than mere polygon numbers. In version 1, as Sam enters the geothermal plant, his partner John is captured and is cut down by a hail of gunfire. It's a pretty startling moment, as this was the first time an agent of Third Echelon had been killed on screen. However, much like the death of Sarah Fisher, it's purely there for the quick shock value. It's never mentioned again, and doesn't affect the story going forward in any way, unfortunately. Sam, Lambert, I just reached one of the labs. It's empty. But there are signs that something very... Hamza's not much more interesting than John as a partner, but he has some dialogue and does come back later in both versions of the game, so at least in version 2 you have a little more interaction with him prior to these later game moments. If you're familiar with Splinter Cell, you'll notice that the HUD has changed fairly significantly, as there really isn't much of one. Instead of the light meter, sound meter, and health bars of old, Sam has a small on-screen objective bar with a little light next to it, which matches the one on the radio on his back. The colored circle and radio is version 1's light meter. Green and Sam is hidden. Yellow, he's exposed. And red is when you're actively engaged with enemy troops. I can recall that around this time, in addition to regenerating health, minimal HUD elements were a hot trend. This lack of on-screen indicators, combined with progressively more realistic graphics, gave games a much more immersive feeling in some instances, and I can remember games like Fight Night Round 3 feeling so new and cutting edge, in part because of the limited HUD. As far as Splinter Cell is concerned, however, I cannot stand this system. I appreciate what they were going for, but my big problem with the light indicator versus the traditional light meter is that, unlike the usual light meter, there's no indication when you're slowly becoming exposed to light. In previous titles, I could see that this path was risky, and could change course or make some shadows to conceal me. In Double Agent, however, I'll be green, 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 and without notice, I'm in the yellow and completely exposed. It also doesn't help that, because of how bright the graphics are, there aren't as many discernible shadows as in games of yore. So, it can be really hard to tell where I'll be lit up like a Dutch brothel, or where I'll be a ghost's shadow, as a wise man once said. <laughs>
I get staying with the times, I do, but this was a big step back for this series. Thankfully, in version 2 of Double Agent, the gorgeous Chiaroscuro from Chaos Theory is present, and playing with the dynamic of light and shadow to maintain stealth is as viable as it's ever been. In art, chiaroscuro is a painting technique where the artist uses deep contrasts between shadow and light, and was commonly seen in the Baroque period in Europe during the 17th and 18th century. The literal translation of the word is light-dark, with chiaro meaning bright and oscuro meaning gloomy. In a post from Brian Zuleta, a concept artist working on the upcoming remake of Splinter Cell, he details that the team is placing emphasis back on chiaroscuro and the moody lighting of old games in the franchise. Looking at some of this concept art, you can see these contrasts clearly, and I'm there for it. Back to version 2 of Double Agent, we see the light and sound meter return in full. I have to say, this HUD looks like complete butthole. It even kind of resembles the crinkled exit on your bottom. Weapon, alarm, and objective notifications are present on the outer ring, and the inner circle is your light meter, sound meter, and health. I also greatly appreciate the return of the ambient noises marker on the sound meter, indicating how much noise in the environment you can use as cover. It's a subjective complaint, but the meter from Chaos Theory was absolutely perfect and didn't need to be changed. Ah oh, well, at least it's here and it works well. Oh, and if you hadn't noticed, Sam is wearing his classic sneaking suit in this version, and that gets a standing O from me, bitch. Sounds good to me, baby! The end of the level in Iceland is where we see another big change between both versions. After his partner is killed, Sam needs to stop a missile from launching. He twists some valves and pushes some buttons, beep boop beep, dominoes fall, you extract via rope right into the Osprey. Or do you? Suddenly a cutscene plays where Sam is running across a snowfield towards the bird, not even wearing close to the outfit he just had on. Ah, I see. These cutscenes were made prior to Shanghai developing their level. Huh. Additionally, this is the moment where Sam learns of his daughter's demise. It's such a jarring tonal shift. Uh, <clears throat> hey Sam, uh, you just lost a partner in the field after warning us he wasn't ready. Uh, we didn't listen, then you stopped a missile, and oh hey, welcome aboard, your uh, daughter's dead, okay? Wait, what? Okay. Version 2 handles this much better. Firstly, there's a scene where you're introduced to the main baddie of the campaign, Emile Dufresne leader of the JBA. Skipping ahead a little bit, once you complete the level, the cutscene where A.D. Williams and Sam Fisher chat, Williams details what the mysterious weapon, Red Mercury, is and why Dufresne was in Iceland, which was to purchase the substance. To get closer to the JBA, this is where the NSA sets up Sam with his status as a knock after Sarah's death, which lands him in the prison where one of the JBA members, Jamie Washington, is held. Thus, this gives much greater context to who the key players are in the story and why these things matter. After further gameplay sections, Sam and Hisham are set to carry on with their mission when Lambert interrupts with an urgent communication. This scene is excellent. Sam is offended by this call for early extraction. Hamza is a pro but defends his field partner, and Lambert is desperately pleading with Sam to exfiltrate. Sam, listen to me. We've got enough. Get out. Now! It's your call. I'll stay if you do. Listen carefully, both of you. I have other splinter cells on standby. I just activated them. Their mission is to destroy the foundry and everything in it. You better clear out. You're testing my patience, Lambert. Believe me, Sam, I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't have a good reason. Something's happened. What? It's your daughter. The chopper's on its way. Lambert, out. all while the music builds up to a crescendo that leads to a somber vocal and piano melody after Lambert informs Sam that this is about his daughter. Of course we know the outcome, but this made me sad and desperate to hear the news. The cutscene is the same as in version 1, but makes far more sense in version 2 and is much, much more effective as a result. As I say, I've played version 1 of Double Agent a few times over the years, and just assumed the last gen edition was a watered-down copy. 
Playing through this level was a big indicator that version 2 was different and possibly better. I had briefly mentioned the flashback cutscene between Sam and Williams. I presume, based on the limited developmental period and likely slim budget of version 2, that these slideshow cutscenes were used as a cost-effective storytelling strategy. Version 2 does have its own high-quality pre-rendered scenes, but we'll detail them as they come along. In version 1, we see Sam in Ellsworth Penitentiary, located in Kansas. He's discussing the upcoming riot with Jamie Washington, the inmate affiliated with JBA that I had mentioned. Jamie hands Sam a knife, and we gain trust with the JBA. Yep, the trust meter. Another new addition to Double Agent. Throughout the game, Sam can complete objectives in favor of the JBA or the NSA, Sam's true employer. As you progress through missions, you may be asked to spare lives or to take them, based on which organization is making the request, affecting trust levels further. Along with little objectives such as choosing to open cell doors to aid your escape, there are, in version 1 anyhow, three major decisions that can greatly affect your standing with either group. If your trust depletes completely with a faction, you fail the game. The choice and consequence system is nothing as in-depth, the likes of which we would see the following year with the absolute masterpiece Mass Effect but I still like that there was a system implemented, and I really adore the concept anyhow of a man so broken by circumstance and tragedy that he may flirt with the idea of going one step too far under the guise of preserving national security. As I mentioned earlier, Sam isn't affected one iota by Sarah's death, so this isn't incorporated into the drama of teetering on this moral edge, and it doesn't help that the members of the JBA are about as deep as a puddle, but we'll discuss that more later. I like version 1's trust system, and how it can change dynamically. During the breakout at Ellsworth, Jamie will get caught and held up by a guard. If Sam steps in and helps, Sam gets a boost of trust with the JBA. If not, Jamie will defend himself, but you'll lose trust with the JBA. These choices add a modicum of replayability to the game, though again, it's nothing earth-shattering like sparing the Rachni or shooting Rex. I want you to try. So, Sam breaks out of his prison cell like Andy Dufresne, and travels through the somewhat high-tech facility. Based on the pre-release press for Double Agent, I thought this segment was going to be much more significant and extensive in the final game. I fully expected to play an introductory section along with the breakout, but nope. You sneak around the jail, trying to predict what the shitty light meter will grant as far as shadow cover is concerned. We do see the return of the hacking minigame, and don't get used to hearing this, but this is superior to Chaos Theory. It's a streamlined minigame, and I appreciate that. Sam can still interrogate people, which is good, it's a classic staple of the series, but in version 1, Sam is nearly humorless. He'll occasionally crack a joke, but he just usually grunts out threats. Tag, you're it. Oh, crap! I'd prefer not to have to hurt you. That would be nice. What do you want to know? Tell me how to cause some damage around here. Be creative. It feels like the team at Montreal just knew how to write Sam's character better. They incorporate much more of Sam's sardonic humor, as well as his cold, calm threats of violence if he doesn't get what he wants. It's much more of the Sam Fisher that you'd know and love. Back in Ellsworth, the ongoing riot is a decent visual effect, but the environment is kind of bland. Metal detectors, keypads, thick, polished gunmetal doors, broken up by the spiral guard tower where Sam can find a non-lethal shotgun, and a section in the galley where inmates and guards are locked into a close-quarters pistol battle. 
It's okay, but in my memory, I can recall a big, massive outbreak with bodies everywhere and complete bedlam. Playing through this version now, it's kind of tame. In the end, Jamie and Sam procure a news helicopter and off they go to JBA headquarters in New York. Here we see the end of the level objectives, including star objectives, which were exclusive to version 1. Star objectives, when completed, can unlock new equipment for the player to use for the remainder of the game. It usually involves playing on the stealthy side, and it's not hard to unlock all the gear. It's okay, and I always like having extra incentive to chase new items in the game, but I think I used maybe three or four of these new items throughout the entire game. They're useful, but there's just so much stuff. It would have been nice to select a few bits of gear as a pre-mission loadout, but it wasn't to be. We'll talk a little more about the gear later, but all in all, other than the ultrasonic emitter, most of this stuff went relatively untouched. So the prison in version 1 is, for me, a bit of a disappointment. Version 2, on the other hand, is a whole different bouquet of flowers. Right off the rip, you'll notice the visual differences between both prisons in both versions. In version 1, Sam's cell is locked with a nifty glass-clad polycarbonate door, tapping into that near-future Tom Clancy style that those games often strive for. In version 2, it's an old iron bar cell door with the painted, cast-in-place walls surrounding you. Sam and Jamie are wearing the classic orange jumpsuits, and Sam's escape route has been altered. Instead of getting right into the riot, a la version 1, Jesus Christ! Look at those facial graphics, god damn! Uh, sorry. As much as I favor the lights and shadows of this version, that face is decidedly old generation. Woo. Anyway, what was I saying? Oh, instead of jumping right into the riot, this version of Ellsworth involves Sam sneaking into a guard office to retrieve a two-way radio. It's a cool little sequence topped off with a timer that requires Sam to return to his cell before guards call muster, which is a nice bit of tension. It's not complicated, but I liked it. After this, Sam meets with Lambert, who offers more bits of storyline and states that he has a Splinter Cell team on standby to assist with the breakout, set to go later that night. He also talks about someone named Barnum, a man that Jamie wants snuffed out. Turns out he's an important DOJ witness whom Lambert says Sam must not kill, despite the risk that this poses to his trust with the JBA. This transitions right into the trust meter of version 2. So, at times, Sam will be put on the spot and forced to make a binary decision, affecting his trust with the JBA or the NSA, just like version 1, however, there's a single major difference. Whereas in version 1 you have the double trust meter, one for each group, version 2 has a single meter that tips one way or the other, JBA or NSA, based on Sam's decision and behaviors throughout missions. Most of the bigger choices like this one are presented in an awfully video gamey way with a few big ugly button prompts on the screen. But first, this is a video game, lest we forget. Second, I quite like how Sam Fisher narrates a quick summary of his decisions and how they're going to affect the game. Again, these choices aren't as elaborate as something like Mass Effect, but they do remind me of Infamous, another game where as soon as I was presented with my first major scenario choice, I knew instantly I would go back to run it again to see the other option play out. Once you deal with Barnum, you see the single trust meter, which, based on my decision to knock the guy out, nets me trust with the NSA, but it moves me further away from favor with the JBA. <coughs> hey, Fisher. <coughs> Thanks for saving my ass. Glad you left Barnum's in one piece. I'm not that interested in his ass life. I have a problem with violence. Me too. I keep on starting it. This decision doesn't change the game's ending or anything like that, but it does have consequences. Because I knocked out Barnum instead of icing him, Jamie doesn't trust me with this pistol, so he keeps it for himself. Although, oddly enough, even if you do get this handgun, Jamie still gets one too. So, eh. I can find a syringe filled with adrenaline for our escape, which, as you see here, helps return some trust to the JBA side of my meter. 
It's here where we can see more of the drop dead gorgeous lighting from this engine, hearkening back to my previous point about chiaroscuro, which is then quickly replaced by the animation of Sam holding a man hostage with his knife holding pose, despite not having a blade. Mm, they can't all be winners, I suppose. As far as gameplay is concerned, this version of Ellsworth plays much more like a traditional Splinter Cell level, without the high-tech gear. Sam eventually procures a kitchen knife, but that's about it. It reminds me a bit of Escape from Butcher Bay, which is one of my favorite games, so this is a good thing. Instead of being held up by a guard in version 1, Jamie gets locked into the gas chamber by other inmates, and Sam needs to break him out. All right. I'll I touched on it earlier, but one thing I really enjoyed about the prison level in version 2 is how dingy and rusted Ellsworth feels compared to the relatively clean, starched facility in version 1. This one feels and plays like I thought it would when I was reading those early previews way back when. Much more Alcatraz and much less Air One. I mean, once you're in the lower levels, passing by solitary confinement chambers and through the morgue, this level almost starts to feel like a horror game for a minute. Passing through the chapel kind of reminded me of Shale Bridge Cradle. Real ones will understand that reference. But it's not all roses. Sometimes Jamie gets in your way and can actually die in combat, which is a problem since he's the dickhead that starts fights with his little pea shooter. So Sam and Jamie are off to JBA headquarters in New Orleans. Not New York. Nope. In version 1, it's New York. In version 2, it's New Orleans. Minor details. Anyway. I really enjoyed playing through this model of Ellsworth Penitentiary, and again, being that I'm new to version 2, I was surprised at how much more in-depth this level was compared to its next-gen counterpart. So this is one of the biggest differences between the two versions of Double Agent, JBA Headquarters. In version 1 on the 360, you get four separate missions in JBA HQ. Sam is introduced to his living quarters by Jamie Washington and meets some team members like Carson Moss, head of security. I was supposed to be in the server room five minutes ago anyway. What do you want me to do? Die, but that's not an option. Listen, Moose. It's Moss. Get it right or pay the price. It's I hope we never part. Now get it right or pay the price. Just shut up and follow me. So JBA HQ acts as a sort of hub world between missions, but it's not like the Normandy where you can walk around socializing and then hit a button when you want to leave. Sam is generally commanded by a JBA member to take care of some tedious new guy work, like completing a lame training course to practice safe cracking a really lame mine assembly minigame, seriously, who thought this was a good idea? And a really, really lame decryption minigame where Sam has to line up numbers on this three-dimensional cube so that none of them line up with each other on another part of the cube or something. I don't know. This took me a long time to complete this, and I had to reload my save twice in order to do it in time. But these are just the required missions. They net you some star equipment, progress the game, and I pretty much do them as quickly as I can and move on to the good stuff. The good stuff is where you move into restricted territory to do some detective work. Sam goes into crouch mode and has to sneak undetected. If he's caught where he shouldn't be, he loses a chunk of JBA trust and will continue to lose it until he's out of the restricted area. If you're caught using NSA equipment, you instantly lose all trust and it's game over. Overall, I really love doing sneaky objectives. Planting spy equipment on the roof, uploading a virus to the JBA mainframe, recording voice samples in real time as people speak to gain access to even more sections of the map, then there's also rifling through various team member personnel files in their private quarters, including a part that I really, really treasure, where you break into Emile's office and just when you think you're making out okay, Dufresne and Jamie come waltzing into the room, causing you to hide pronto before being discovered. Then shortly thereafter, going through Emile's personal information while he sleeps merely feet away from you. These moments are excellent, 
and offer a great deal of tension to the experience and really do help to sell the whole double agent premise of the game. I suppose my only issues, aside from the impressively bad objectives mentioned earlier, is the wonky light meter getting me busted in some areas, and the time limit. This is why I had to reload the Rubik's Cube puzzle a couple times. You see, for each HQ mission, Sam is given 25 minutes to do as he pleases, taking care that his primary objective is complete. On one hand, this adds a degree of pressure that makes the mission that much more stressful, but overall, I probably would have enjoyed being able to explore and sneak at my leisure, but that's okay. Additionally, I like that your exploration can be rewarded. In the second HQ mission after breaking into Emile's safe, if you run out of the back, off the balcony, and sneak into this room, you'll get a little surprise. Sam! Oh, you're just full of surprises, aren't you? I do my best. You're not cleared to be up here. I'm gonna have to report this, Sam. Mixing business and pleasure can get tricky. You're telling me. I'll tell you what, next time, bring flowers. This time... This is sweet because not only is it a great easter egg meant to reward the extra curious, but it negates having to do all that mine assembly nonsense. Although, if you think about it, the two activities aren't too dissimilar. I have to see if my balls can fit in there too. Like, all right, how's that, baby? They both in there, soft, but his balls and dick is in there. You okay? How's that feel? Filled up? You feel filled up? The big hook in JBA missions are the choices. As they come up in the story, I'll talk more about the really big decisions, but in the first HQ mission, you get your first taste. The pilot of the chopper you escaped Ellsworth on, Cole Yeager, is being held captive, and Emil wants you to pop him and prove your loyalty. It's a pretty intense scene, and helps to remind you that John Brown's army are the bad guys. Basically, if you don't do it, someone else will. Either way, Cole is taken out, so your choice is of little consequence outside of the trust meter, but again, this is just a taste of decisions to come. In contrast, version 2 of Double Agent is much different. First, there are only two levels where Sam is at the headquarters, as opposed to four in version 1. Secondly, this is nothing like the HQ missions from version 1. Instead of walking in plain sight, completing missions under a time limit, these two missions are a bit more like traditional Splinter Cell levels. Sam was set out on an errand by Dufresne, and in the process, made his way back to HQ under the cover of night to infiltrate the compound to gather as much intel as he can. Herein lies one way the version 2 trust meter can affect gameplay. If you err on the side of the NSA, you basically get a stealth loadout, a la Chaos Theory, with much greater amounts of non-lethal ammo and gadgets. In this case, because I spared Barnum in the jail, I'm afforded more rubber bullets for my SC-303 launcher and the like. If you play the game with more favor towards the JBA, you'll get more lethal ammo and gear, a la the assault loadout in Chaos Theory. Playing somewhere in the middle nets you a loadout much like Redding's recommendation. Honestly, this is kind of a dumb system, but I'll get more into that in just a second. While undercover at JBA HQ, Sam can sneak through the facility and perform similar detective work to that of version 1. Scanning for fingerprints is still a cool little visual effect, the AI pathfinding, though, can get a little wonky here and there, but... It's nothing a rubber bullet can't fix. <laughs> Damn. Oh yeah, and Sam can knock out JBA members as he slips around base. It's a little strange from a storytelling perspective, as I'm pretty sure this would rouse serious suspicion, but from a gameplay perspective, Honestly, I really love having these rubber bullets and the OCP for disrupting electronics. Also, you get a look at version 2's Soundwave hacking minigame. All you have to do is match the wavelengths and you're good. And honestly, I kind of like this little game. This is where we see another decisional moment for Sam. In this version, Cole Yeager is not the helicopter pilot that you blast in the noodle. He's a JBA member and he wants to take over for a meal behind his back. 
This is the dirt on Cole Yeager. Looks like he's plotting to take over the JBA. I'm not sure Emil will like that. If I send this to Emil, Jaeger's dead within the hour. But if I send it to Lambert, there might be a chance to extract Jaeger and pump him for information. Thanks for the information, Sam. We'll deal with Jaeger. He'll disappear before... Okay. Now I'll finish my thoughts on the trust meter in this version. So, as you see, I send the information about Cole to Lambert. When games have a binary system, I kinda like playing my first run as a good guy, and then I come back and play a proper menace. So just playing as I naturally would, I go about performing the quote unquote good way. However, in doing this, I tipped my trust balance far in the favor of the NSA. Not a big deal, yet. I complete one more objective, and now my trust is full with the NSA. Somehow, someway, Emil Dufresne just magically detected that I wasn't being loyal to him, and demands that I return to my living quarters in a given amount of time, otherwise I'll fail my mission. When I report to Emil, I arbitrarily gain my trust back, and that's that. This is such an incredibly silly system. I totally understand making decisions on a mission that Emil would be privy to, that's fine. But this magical detection of disloyalty is just awful. However, this wasn't the biggest issue, and I had to make it back to this exact point to complete the mission anyway, so eh. Later in the game, when I'm tasked with defusing nuclear bombs, oh and by the way, it's pronounced nuclear, not nuclear. I just wanted to mention that. Anyway. I defuse a nuke, and because this tips me in the favor of the NSA, Emil is suspicious, and calls for Sam to report back, lest he fail. <sighs> this is stupid for the reasons mentioned previously, but this is also right before you head into the final mission where, spoilers, no matter what choices you've made throughout the game, Sam automatically loses all JBA trust regardless. So, I attempt to run all the way back to report in, but I didn't make it in time. I didn't fail the mission due to trust, however, when the timer ran out. I got some balance in the meter back, but I failed to defuse all the bombs. Are you confused? That's understandable. So, anyway, I loaded a save and defused the bombs in a different order to be closer to the extraction point, and it was fine. But I shouldn't have had to do that anyway. Most of the time, it's really not a big deal, and these were the only two instances where the trust meter was a pain in the cheeks. Also, I understand that the game is called Double Agent, not NSA Agent, so maintaining balance is key to the theme of the game. I get it. So, Sam just sneaks about JBA and completes objectives. All the lovely, moody lighting that I've been rambling on about is present here. Though, I love that Sam can hold up and interrogate enemies using his little voice modulator. No noise. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask some questions and you're going to answer them. Surprise. Who the hell are you? A music critic. Now tell me how Emil gets around the compound so fast. You have to be kidding me. I'm head of security. I know and I appreciate the job that you do. It's so goofy, but it is funny being able to interrogate the likes of Carson Moss a few times. You can do this again later, but we'll get to that. This is classic Sam dialogue, and it's always a pleasure hearing the great Michael Ironside do his thing. I've said it before, but nobody can ever replace Ironside as this character. He is Sam Fisher, and when he dies, hopefully a long time from now, the character dies with him. One last thing to mention about JBA HQ in version 2. If you're spotted by a camera, you can do this sort of bizarre fake surrender a la recent Hitman games. Then you can perform an odd quick time event to evade capture. It's strange, but hey, it definitely beats an auto fail and having to redo a ton of mission progress, so there's that. So at this point in Double Agent, both versions mix up level order a little bit. 
After the first JBA mission in version 1, Sam heads out to the Sea of Okosk to take over a tanker, the RSS Rublev. In version 2, Sam does eventually commandeer a tanker in the Pacific as well, but first we're presented with an exclusive mission not found on the next generation consoles. Just as well, version 1 has an exclusive mission set in Shanghai, not found on the old gen consoles. So, to keep things cohesive, let's take time to talk about each game's exclusive mission. Starting with the money train in version 2. The idea is simple. There's a train, and as you may have guessed it, there's money on it. Emile Dufresne wants the money to do… things, I guess. Bad guy things. Sam and JBA member Enrique Villablanca work their way through an old, decrepit portion of the train station under Grand Central Station in New York City. New York City. Lambert orders you to not eliminate anyone lethally, but Emile wants no breathing witnesses. I just kind of knocked out everyone just because that's how I normally play. I guess I don't like to waste ammo. The opening portion of the level is solid, and I like creeping through some of these sort of ruined areas deep underground. I like that we get to see the dynamic sound meter in action too, and we can use this man welding as an excuse to skirt around a little bit quicker. I also like that you can use the split jump as an active move to evade opponents quickly. So, I should mention that I appreciate the people that commented on my Chaos Theory review that pointed out my mistake when I said that they removed the split jump from the game. All these years later, and I had no idea. I suppose that's because it was never really necessary due to the more open level design. And I just foolishly assumed that the move had been axed, so thank you to everyone for pointing it out. In this part though, it feels like the move was incorporated smartly. You could just run off into the shadows, but it was nice to have the choice to avoid fast approaching enemies using the split jump. This is the meat of this section of Money Train. The decision to assassinate the station chief for Emil, or spare him for Lambert. If you choke out the chief, you gain a bit of JBA trust and you get to spare an innocent man. If you put a knee through his spinal column, well, you receive a big boost of JBA trust, but Lambert rightly shames you. This moment doesn't affect the mission or overall story, which is kind of disappointing, but at least it happens in-game and not on a menu screen. The level leads into an old-timey train station complete with classic ticket booths and the like. Definitely getting some Roscoe Street Station vibes in here, and hey, you can't tell me that jacket doesn't look a little familiar. So Sam hops aboard the train and off it goes. Sam works his way up through each cart, solving little stealthy puzzles along the way with guards and obstacles. There's some fairly tedious laser OCP gameplay and some frustrating enemy patterns. Also, you can make a little trust decision to cut away a train cart filled with employees, knowing of the impending crash. That's a nice little touch. Eventually, Sam makes his way atop the train, somewhat similar to the sequence in Pandora Tomorrow, except with overhead obstacles that Sam automatically ducks. There's a good sense of speed, and eventually guards will head up to investigate, adding a smidgen of tension, but it's really nothing special, and is honestly kind of boring compared to Pandora. In the end, Sam takes over the train, and in one of the few high-quality pre-rendered scenes, Sam derails the train, Moss executes the poor conductor, and realizing his body count, Sam is clearly overcome with the weight of his current mission. It's a solid cutscene, and the level overall, while not amazing, is done well enough. Then we have version 1's exclusive mission. Taking place after the RSS Rublev, which we'll talk about shortly, Sam and the JBA head out to Shanghai. The level starts with one of two contrived action moments in the game, what I would describe as barely interactive cutscenes, the other of which happens over the Sea of Okosk. In this segment, the pilot of this helicopter just happens to suffer a heart attack and keels over, relegating Sam to pilot the bird and get it steady. You just roll the stick a little bit to level it out, and done. That was it. Just a little sequence to add some drama. 
You fly like crap. Right. Once you're on the roof, you receive a secret call from Hisham Hamza, your partner from Iceland in version 2. This is your first meeting with Hisham in this version, which I suppose was done to somewhat set up a dramatic moment later. The mission takes place in a slightly modified version of the real Jin Mao Tower, taking place on the night of the Chinese New Year, hence the fireworks over the city and festivities inside the tower. The first area is a simple stealth section, standard guard clearing. It's still held back by the lack of dark shadows and the crummy light meter, but it's serviceable. But it's here where I could really appreciate some of the gorgeous visual effects on offer. For a game from close to 20 years ago, my god, I cannot believe it's been that long. These graphics are still very pretty. You can see the shortcuts in several of the areas, and I do remember that the game ran a lot crappier on original hardware, but with the Series XS enhancements, this is still a bit of a looker. The rain effects on this enemy's uniform are still stunning. Oh, and you get to see the phenomenal corner takedown, a move which I really enjoy pulling off. The animation is excellent and it really does give you that panther-like feeling to your stealth takedowns. After playing version 1, playing version 2 without this move definitely felt a little empty. On the subject of effects that still hold up, Special mention has to be made for the audio design. The bombastic war sounds in later levels are all well and good, but the more subtle sound design pleasantly surprised me. I really appreciate the little sonic details, like rain becoming louder and thumping a bit deeper when Sam walks under a few thick planks of wood. It's nothing that makes or breaks the game, but it enriches the title in ways that most people who play through may not pick up on. I also grew fond of the increasingly loud score that occurs when you get closer to an enemy, as well as the sharp note that shrieks when you grab him. Not only does it add a bit of drama upon your approach, but it's also a soft, helpful audio cue that a bad guy is near you if you haven't seen him yet. After the rooftop, we move into rappelling down the side of the building. If you look closely at the cityscape, you can see some of those graphical shortcuts that were made to preserve performance, but this is still visually impressive. The beautiful backdrop of fireworks kabooming over the city lights of Shanghai, filling the sky with shades of blue and pink. Lovely. Then we get some classic Splinter Cell gameplay, with Fisher recording a secret conversation between the bad guys with his directional mic. How nobody sees him through the window is beyond me, but okay. So look, I know this sequence is pretty hard to fail, even with the helicopter illuminating the windows for some reason, but for my money, I love this segment, I do. It's that sort of quintessential spy stuff that the series is known for. Not to mention, you get to throw a dude out of a window. <laughs> Bye. Once inside the building, Sam is tasked with retrieving a sample of red mercury from the meeting room. Here we see Sam's big fat ass having trouble squeezing through the windows in the laundry room. Sneaking through the hotel is pretty sweet, however. I can't describe why I love it but the feeling of creeping through a warm, dry interior while a rainstorm and celebratory city is just outside the window for miles around is oddly pleasing. Cracking the safe containing the mercury right next to Emil and Moss while the money is being counted is classic spy stuff and is pretty thrilling. There are odd little visual bugs, such as this self-smoking cigarette in the hallway, but Nothing game-breaking. Here we can hear Big Sam cracking elevator glass with his sheer girth. Repelling 
Rappelling down the center of this tower, alongside of this gigantic inflatable Nyan, as the crowd counts down to the new year, is awesome. If you look down, you can see the teeny tiny little crowd hundreds and hundreds of feet below. The only odd thing is that the celebration just kind of suddenly ends, and it sounds strange. Here, you'll see two major upgrades from the star objectives that I use the most. The first is the fast OCP recharge, which is a very welcome upgrade. The second and most prominent is the ultrasonic emitter. In essence, this turns whistles into a projectile, causing the AI to promptly follow the noise like a good boy. It's basically as overpowered as it sounds, and I didn't use it all the time, but it certainly got me out of a few jams. There's one last quote unquote upgrade that we'll chat about later though. Mm. Shanghai concludes with Fisher picking one last safe, and per Hisham, the CIA wants a target eliminated. You pop the good doctor and zip line out of a window into a JBA chopper. Mission complete. Is Shanghai perfect? Nope. Is it a damn fine splinter cell level? Yeah, in my opinion, it is. And it's a solid exclusive for version 1 of Double Agent. Alright, so now we're back on track with comparing both versions of Double Agent. The levels in Okosk and Cozumel, Mexico, are basically flip-flopped in order. In version 1, you play Russia and then Cozumel, whereas in version 2, you play Cozumel and then Russia. But they're close enough, and we'll talk about them together to keep the comparisons consistent. So, that other interactive cutscene that I mentioned is the freefall when Sam parachutes onto an iceberg. Visually, it's pretty cool with the sensation of freezing air whipping by your face, but when Sam has a shoot malfunction and has to save himself, it's as simple as a few button presses and you really can't fail unless you're doing so on purpose. Much like the helicopter in Shanghai, it's pointless. Once you land on the ice, you'll notice something stark. Sunlight, and a lot of it. It feels… wrong. This white sneaking suit is rad, and reminds me of the one that Fisher had in an exclusive PS2 level of the first game, but without the cover of darkness, Ubisoft Shanghai was certainly taking us out of our comfort zone, and many people didn't like it. This section is pretty simple to creep on by and retrieve your gear, so the daylight isn't so bad. Well, until you get to the base camp. Now first and foremost, it must be said that the snow flurries falling all over look gorgeous. Absolutely lovely. You'd think that this snowstorm would cause poor visibility, yes? Well, yeah, it does. For you. Here's the big issue. Because the terrible color light meter doesn't show me in the magical green zone, enemies over 50 meters away can see me just fine in this blizzard, despite my camouflage and the storm. Therefore, as pretty as the graphics are, they're merely window dressing. With the lack of shadows and the enemy's unaffected sight, this section is an absolute chore to wade through. I really don't like to use the word hate too often as I feel like it cheapens it, but I really hate this level. It's old school, trial and error splinter cell in the worst way. This is something Chaos Theory began to move the series away from, and to see it come screaming back into full force here, minus the shadows for cover, is a shame. Thankfully, version 2's Akosk doesn't have this problem. Sam is dropped into a frozen island in the darkness of night. The objective is simple, go from mercenary camp to mercenary camp, taking out tangos and disabling their communications. The visuals are, for a 6th generation console game, fantastic. The gorgeous frozen tundra illuminated with aurora borealis, all with the backdrop of the vessel you've come to capture, made this a pleasant visual spectacle. The gameplay is classic chaos theory with some open paths to get to and from each base camp. 
Combat is about on par with Chaos Theory for better and for worse. It's not the smoothest, but it's still better than the first two games. However, Splinter Cell is still very much not a combat game. Some little bugs do occur, like where does my flashbang go here, but all in all, combat is serviceable. Though, to be honest with you, I just kind of picked this fight to record the footage. Stealth is always number one. Back in version 1, after the dreadful base camp, you make your way to the tanker. I've made mention of the graphics already, but it bears one more note here that what Ubisoft Shanghai was able to do with a heavily modified Unreal Engine 2 is exceptional. The shimmering sunlight through the thick translucent sheet of ice, the frightened expression of the opponent in your clutches, it's all very easy on the eyes. I enjoy the creature from the Black Lagoon sneak attack that Sam can do against the enemy on this rib. Aside from the violence, that's pretty funny. Your buddies at JBA want you to eliminate everyone on board. Naturally, this goes against the NSA's wishes, but eh, I played kind of panther style and knocked out most while icing a few. Another new addition to Double Agent was the on-screen radar activated with a left bumper. When standing still, the mini-map reveals enemy locations and their status, kind of like Manhunt. It's pretty useful on this map, but honestly, I rarely used it for the remainder of the game. Anyway, the tanker mission in version 1 is one that I wanted to love because I enjoy sneaking around these little open-ended maps, picking off sentries one by one, especially as Moss counts them down with psychotic glee. But frankly, this map just kind of sucks. Due to the aforementioned impeccable enemy visibility, I had to load a few checkpoints due to being busted by an enemy posted on a catwalk off in the distance, and it seemed like my stupid color meter was always in the yellow. I know I mentioned the mini radar, but I didn't want to have to stop every three feet and check my radar to gauge enemy position. I would have preferred some shadow cover instead. I did get to play around with a little more equipment, which is good, but this level was just so much frustrating trial and error. Speaking of trial and error, the end of this level has you squaring off against a mad captain aware of his crew's demise. He's holding a lit flare which, if dropped, sets off a chain of explosions that detonate the entire ship. It's a very simple segment. You sneak up on this platform, jump onto the catwalk, and snatch the captain up. But this is the shit I'm talking about, man, with this freaking light meter. I'm green, I'm green, oh, I'm yellow, and we're toast. This happened several times, and suffice it to say, I had had enough. Son of a bitch. But at least there was a conclusion to version 1's tanker. Well, when I came aboard on version 2, I get knocked out and captured. Good job, me. This capture and evasion scene plays out exactly like the one in Kokobo Sosho. And then you're off to scurry about the bowels of the ship doing sneaky things. I run around, I slit a few troats, and find the captain's office. The captain basically yells at me that he won't give up the ship, and that he set four bombs around the vessel for me to find. I guess he had done that before I arrived and was waiting for an opportunity to use them, I don't know. The interior is basically just the Maria Narcissa repurposed, which is fine. I know about budget and time limits and so forth. The diffusal minigame is tricky at first, but once you fiddle with your multivision goggles, it's pretty easy to figure out. You make your way to the upper deck and work through a series of turrets, guards, and wall mines on your way to the captain's quarters. That settles it. Now all that's left is take care of the captain. I like Sam narrating the mission progress, giving the player a real-time update. That's a clever use of audio. After everything is said and done, it's time to have the epic confrontation with the captain. Let's do this, captain. I'm... That was it? Oh, God, come on. A prompt? Level over? Ah, <sighs> all right. In my opinion, aside from the decent nighttime base camp section of version 2, everything else about the missions in Akosk across both versions is pure detritus. 
which is another way of saying garbage. The broad daylight concept, as I've touched on previously, is really fascinating. And the idea of needing to depend on gadgets and plain old cover is pretty thrilling, when it works right. The mission on the Mexican cruise ship off the shores of Quintana Roo is an example of this concept coming to near fruition. Version 1's Cozumel is a level I've always had a bit of a soft spot for, and the one map where it was actually kind of cool to sneak around in the daylight. It's not perfect, more on that shortly, but the concept of sneaking through the cruise ship and using card table cloths, stacked up pool deck furniture, and the pool itself as camouflage is pretty good. Seeing that green light on my back under the blue canopy of pool water provided a great sense of relief. Sam can hide in lockers like his Japanese counterpart with the bandana, which definitely came in clutch once or twice during my version 1 run. In terms of gear, we have the returning classics, such as sticky cameras, as well as the ever-effective sticky shockers, and of course the always impactful airfoil rounds. Being so cramped and well lit, I had to bring out the old toys, and although ghosting the level is the ultimate experience, these are still a fun way to get around and get out of a pickle. Speaking of returning gadgets, you may have noticed that I hadn't discussed the night vision yet, and really I shouldn't have to. This was something that was perfected in the very first Splinter Cell game. I know it's not quote realistic or whatever, but the whitish filter of Sam's goggles has always been perfect for these games. In version 2, it's fine, just chaos theory again, which is no bad thing. In version 1, what is this? This is it, huh guys? This lime green Game Boy filter plus smeared Vaseline mixed with savage jizz over the tubes is the night vision in version 1. And it is terrible. I guess I shouldn't be complaining about how light the game is if it means I get to avoid using this night vision mode. Now is a good time to mention the very last star objective upgrade that you can unlock. Gotta skip ahead in the game a little bit. So, for completing all your star objectives, you receive a night vision mode upgrade. Oh, thank goodness, we can replace the ugly green... Ugh. Ugh. God damn it. <sighs> so for your troubles, you get your screen brightness turned up a little bit with a lined filter like an old CRT monitor. And it's fuzzy when you move. BITCHES! Another issue I had with version 1 is, due to the FOV, the camera tends to smash right up into Fisher's back. It happens regularly in tight corridors, which is most of the game, so it gets pretty annoying on the regular. And again, like the night vision, the camera work was fairly solid from the first game. It needed some tweaking, sure, but this is what we got. Where the daylight concept of Cozumel kind of stinks are in situations like this. So I hide behind this buffet table as my options for concealment are slim. Well, I'm in the magical yellow exposure zone, so Buddy Boy here sees me and comes jogging over. I tried some slick evasive maneuvers, but he's got me cornered and I'm cooked. Ah, but on my next try, I was able to use my gear and I was fine, so it's not a big deal. And hey, I did say I had a soft spot for this mission, and I meant it. I like the theme of the level, and some of the dialogue is even somewhat humorous for once. Look, I know a pretty cute girl. She sucks a mean. In all, I'd say this is the best of the three major daylight missions in version one of Double Agent, with one more still to come. At least, unlike that one I have yet to mention, it still feels like Splinter Cell, mechanically. Also, the end of the mission sets up one of the big three decisions of version one. So, in this version of Double Agent, Sam is faced with three big decisions that can have actual, noticeable ramifications on the game going forward. The first of which is when Fisher sets a bomb on the cruise ship in Cozumel. When Sam sets the bomb, he can intercept the detonation frequency. Whatever you were doing, what exactly were you doing, Sam? Don't get paranoid. We just planted a bomb. 
paranoid is appropriate. Immediately following Cozumel, you head back for JBA Headquarters Mission 3, the one where you do the stupid Rubik's Cube decryption puzzle. Anyway, after the uh, what have you, you head back to Emil and all the members gather around the television to watch the bomb go off. If you intercepted the detonation frequency in Cozumel, you can choose to jam the signal of the bomb, keeping it from exploding. This spares the crew on board in Mexico, but your JBA trust drops a great deal, and Emil smokes Enrica at point blank. You blame to go around. Now get out of my sight! I've got King Shasta to think about. You can also choose to jam the signal and frame Enrica. Enrica still gets a kiss from the Luger. Ah! But you reduce the amount of JBA trust you lose while sparing innocence. As for the uh, final choice, well. In three, two, one. Woo! Ah! Innocent people are torched to cinders, which makes Emil happy, and Enrica lives on to get pumped by Fisher. Fuck this. So here's what I meant earlier about the big three decisions having ramifications. If you choose the good version of two out of three of these big decisions, and you have a trust rating of greater than 33% with the NSA, you unlock a special endgame bonus mission set in the New York Harbor, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So we can cover the other big decisions as they come. For now, let's get into version two of Cozumel. In opposition to version one's daytime party boat-esque atmosphere, Version 2 is a bit more of a honeymoon cruise ship and brings back the moody lighting, the terrifying infinity of the ocean at night, and a really subtle but hypnotic tune by composer Michael McCann under the pseudonym Behavior. The Spanish guitar, splashy trip-hop beat, and the ghost-like whistling really caught my ear. I suppose now would be a fair time to mention the soundtrack. So, first and foremost, Michael McCann composed the score for Deus Ex Human Revolution, which automatically makes me a fan of his, as I absolutely adore the music in that game. The score for Splinter Cell Double Agent isn't bad, and it serves the game well enough insofar as it wasn't obtrusive or thematically inappropriate. The tough guy butt rock song that they used for the bizarre semi-live action trailer was corny trash marketing garbage. Thankfully, the actual in-game tracks are much more suited to the tone of Splinter Cell. But, with respect, this score is in the shadow of Amon Tobin's mesmerizing, colossal soundtrack for Chaos Theory. Mr. McCann did a fine job, and he's a very, very talented musician, clearly. But this score doesn't hold a candle to the one gifted to us in Chaos Theory. The level here is your traditional Splinter Cell fare, almost to a fault. There's nothing here that's bad, and I still enjoy pulling off the neck breaker whilst bracing a pipe with my legs. And, of course, gassing out two enemies with one sticky cam never ever gets old. But the first half of the map is the basic, go here and do this. You meet with Enrica, and they share a bit of flirting before carrying out the objective. Alright, look, I know I could have just used the sticky shocker on him, but it's fun to electrify water in games, what do you want? So, the second part of the mission takes Sam to the guts of the ship, and after sneaking about an engine room for a while, Sam meets with Enrica once more, vaulting her over to a fuel tank where she's going to plant the red mercury explosive device. And this is where Fisher makes the version 2 bomb decision. Again, I like that he narrates this decision. But this pick A or B screen is definitely not as tense or as exciting as version 1's decision in the JBA common area. So, if you decide to upload a virus, you're treated to another one of version 2's exclusive pre-rendered cutscenes, where Sam and Enrica face the consequences of not detonating the bomb. Which is Moss punching Sam in the face, and Emil perving on Enrica for a bit. That's it. 
Well, it's certainly nowhere near as dramatic as this. I do like that with Sam's dialogue, he emphasizes that he just sent 2,000 people on board to their graves. It definitely adds a bit of weight to the choice you just made. Unfortunately, the aftermath of your choice is this. 2,156 dead, and you are responsible for every single one of them. How could you let that happen? I had a choice to make. I made it. I had to keep my cover. I needed Dufresne's trust. Then he sent you to Russia. He needed a tank. That's it. Williams gives you a bit of a guilt trip, Sam gets a handshake, and uh, yeah. I like version 2's Cozumel mission well enough. I really enjoy the sort of spooky cruise ship at night vibe, the various pieces of Mexican artwork posted around, the jazzy lounge with the bubble glass, mahogany beer taps and grand piano, and the final choice is heavy, though consequenceless. It's a good mission, but believe it or not, I prefer version 1. The flaws are absolutely there, and in general, I usually prefer levels rife with shadows and alternate pathways. But this is one area where the daylight shine and aesthetic design kinda won me over. Kudos, Shanghai. If only all daytime levels were as enjoyable. Ugh. Ah! What happens when you take Resident Evil 5, Gears of War, Modern Warfare, Splinter Cell, and throw them into a Vitamix? You get Kinshasa in the Republic of Congo. Kinshasa is the third big daytime mission in version 1 of Double Agent, and it's a bit of a mess. Now, I don't want to just outright say that it's bad. There are shades to this. And I do mean shades. So Sam and Emil go to the Congo for a secret meeting between the three big bads of the story, Masood, Takfir, and Emil himself. Tensions are high and the area is dangerous, so Emil brings Sam along for security, and then he tells him to wait in the car. Okay. Naturally, Sam doesn't abide and sneaks off through the garage into the hotel to record the meeting. Again, I'll say, the visuals in version 1 can really be quite impressive sometimes. The unrelenting sub-Saharan sunlight beaming through the slats in this kitchen window, combined with sparks from a severed line and a steaming pipe on the wall, mixed with a bit of human eye core on the wall. Well, it's unpleasant, and that's the idea. It still amazes me what some developers were able to do with old Unreal 2. Then there's the gameplay. I guess he just knew to turn around instinctively. It must be the cot. So, the Kinshasa Hotel level isn't as much of a pain as the base camp in Okosk. There's some cover and some clear paths set out for Sam to follow, but even with a couple of shadows here or there, this is a bad mix of well-lit environments combined with the awful new light meter combined with AI that runs around in strange patterns. It's not that I wish the enemy AI was boring and predictable, and certainly in a war zone of all places, you wouldn't be expected to walk slowly back and forth. But the trial and error of old Splinter Cell titles comes roaring back into focus here, again. I found myself shamefully save scumming every 10 feet of ground I gained for fear of being discovered when I randomly dip into the yellow zone of exposure. Sam can fight, but as with version 2, this is not the ideal way of play. You have your old faithful, the SC-20K as well as the SC pistol, and I will say, I do like the new first person reflex sight, and prefer it to the scope in version 2 and the old games where the glass takes up your entire screen. Sam's weapon transition animations are still as smooth as ever, and I've always loved how he takes his long gun from his back, reaching with his left hand while preparing to grip the trigger guard with his right hand. But moving along the axes still feels rigid. It's why a game like Gears of War felt so good to play, even on console. The parody of deceleration when sighting a target, the controller dead zones that were just right, and super smooth cover to cover movement. Perfect. In Double Agent, however, I can practically feel myself traveling up and over on a graph. At least it's not a major part of this level. Yet. 
Sam has a new trick or two up his sleeve, one of which is the glass cutter. The game never tells you about this tool, and I kind of found it by accident. Not even the tutorial demos this equipment. So it's cool and it makes Sam seem like the ultimate sneaky spy guy, but there's a giant open window right next to this spot, so you can see why most people wouldn't know about the glass cutter. Outside of the upcoming big decision, the highlight of Kinshasa in version 1 is the big stupid laser room where Sam needs to plan a bug and record the chat between the bad guys. So look, I enjoy big cartoonish villains and their over the top set piece secret layers, especially in spy fiction, but this room is just goofy. These conveniently set pipes to shimmy along, the giant green lasers that for whatever reason are on a timer. The floor is lava, I guess, and you plant a bug in a small vase via hanging from a winch a la Ethan Hunt. Ah well, I didn't dislike this segment, it's just silly as all. The first section of Kinshasa has its frustrations to be sure, but it's really not too shabby. The laser room is followed by a race back to Emil in the parking garage, where he informs you that your next task is to eliminate a mole in the organization, which, as it turns out, is your old buddy, Hishim Hamza. This is the second big decision of version 1. To do this, first we need to book it towards Hisham. This is kind of where the level begins to speed wobble a little bit. First, I have to say, being a lone operative in a hostile, war-torn village is the perfect mix of depressing and thrilling. Some moments, like slaughtering these pricks that were going to execute these civilians, was really gratifying. And the audio design is top-notch. The sounds of artillery, gunfire, and screams combine into a terrifying, stressful symphony. There are also little memorable moments sprinkled throughout, like stopping the aforementioned firing squad or saving this lady from a burning bus, which is not only on brand for Sam Fisher, but opens up another path for traversal. Good. Then the frustration starts. This is where the weak points of Double Agent are exposed bare. The broad daylight and weak combat come barreling at you, and it's ugly and jarring. This section just plain stinks. I know there are ways to ghost through, but just because someone has mastered this rat nest doesn't give it a pass for being awful. Up the communications tower we go, time to make a choice. Do you snipe the rebel leader in the Red Beret, or do you snipe your fellow agent, Hisham Hamza? Here's the thing, this choice fundamentally changes the level. If you shoot Hamza, or let the rebel finish him off, which is brutal, the mission ends and Emil is pleased. However, if you save Hisham's life, this happens. Good work, Sam. You had me worried there for a moment. Now, head to the presidential palace. Isham needs your help. Meet me at the pier after you break him out. After the tower comes down, you find yourself stranded in the streets of this war zone once more, only now even more hostile, with Sam between two warring factions. I have to emphasize again, I do like the idea of sneaking through a bright, kinetic environment. There's something about being so vulnerable and exposed, when it's normally Sam that's the apex predator of every scenario, and it has potential. However, the aforementioned clunky combat, the lack of shadows slash crappy light indicator combined with the FOV and impeccable faculty of hearing and eyesight of each enemy troop makes this segment very difficult to get through. Granted, I wouldn't want a super safe scenario where Sam is just to follow along an obvious predetermined path, kind of like something you'd find in an Uncharted game, but there has to be a balance. 
There's just so much trial and error. It's all of the worst parts of Splinter Cell as a franchise cranked up to 10. Also, I absolutely detest rubbish like this. These guys are fighting heavily armed militia, including a freaking tank. But nope, we can see that lone gringo there through the smoke and now we all focus on him. So we rescue Hamza from the militants and Sam gets a chance to use an explosion elsewhere to convince Emil that he did indeed take the agent out, thus satisfying the NSA and JBA. So is version one Kinshasa bad? Well, let's take a look at the definition of the word bad. You know, no, I'm kidding, of course it's bad. It's an action heavy level with minimal cover and very few if any shadows to blend in. Picking off unsuspecting foes is good fun, but in fast paced encounters where he's outnumbered five to one, Sam fights with the grace of a busted go-kart. I do dislike a Koskmore, but this level still stinks like putrid flatulence, which is farts. One thing I'd like to mention real quick is the return of the statistics screen. Double Agent brought back a similar after action report to that of Chaos Theory, which gives you a rundown of your conquest, including what percentages were deducted from your overall stealth score. And I crushed Kinshasa, dude. 102%, check that out. This feature was removed from version two, likely due to the single meter trust system and how favoring stealth would lose you JBA cred too often. So, version one Kinshasa was a bit of a dud, but straight to the point, this was my first time playing version two of Kinshasa, and it quickly became one of my favorite Splinter Cell levels in the whole series. The mission starts with Emil, Tokfir, and Masood meeting about their plans to use nuclear weapons on three US targets. Again, it's pronounced nuclear. Although the in-engine cutscene looks pretty rough, I do like that it demonstrates Emil's diplomacy and his charisma. Otherwise, in both versions, we really don't get to know members of the JBA all that well. It's a solid scene and sets up clearly what these madmen are preparing to do, which ups the stakes. Fisher is assigned with locating Takfir and Masood's suites in the hotel to gather as much information as he can for both Emil Dufresne and the NSA. But really, the objectives are second fiddle. Gameplay in this level is where it's at. Fisher has a balaclava, some dark clothes, his Gerber Guardian backup, and a whole lot of shadows. I of course love using Sam's high-tech gadgets, but the purity of this portion of Kinshasa is sweet. No tricks, just patience and guile. Due to the ongoing shelling outside from government troops, the hotel experiences rolling blackouts, killing lights and cameras for a short period of time. This is such a clever gameplay hook. Every time you hear incoming fire, it's an audio cue for the player that darkness is coming, allowing you to time your movements in the shadows accordingly. Tension is ratcheted up as you frantically try to knock out a guard or slip past a camera as quickly as you can before the power boots up. As mentioned, Sam doesn't have any gear, no multivision goggles. Sentries have flashlight and guns, so timing and aggressive movements are a must. Being a sleuth and gathering information on Emil's allies is fairly simple. You find the sweets and perform a few hacking games to gather the intel. By the way, sleuthing is not the same as sneaking for anyone that may or may not continually misuse that word. Just wanted to say that. I also have to say, moments like this, I missed the corner takedown from version one, but at least Sam can still palm strike dudes like Boss Rutan. I'm sorry, bang, 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 no I'm not. Also, if you play like trash like I did here and you get alarms, you can find this little white panel on the wall. If you have a guard in your clutches, you can coerce him to lower the alarm for you. It's kind of neat. After gathering all the information you need, Fisher meets with Emil and Jesus Christ. In this scene, Emil states that Hisham Hamza has been identified as a traitor and wants Sam to bump him off to ensure loyalty from Masood. Sam locates a gear drop and now we have our toys back. Sam then finds Hamza in the pool locker room. After chatting with Hisham for a while, it's time to escort him out of the hotel, through the pool and out of an exterior courtyard into the parking lot. Then you get the decision as to what to do. 
Taking out Hamza is nowhere near as dramatic or as exciting as it is in version 1. Really, it's kind of anticlimactic. Sam, I can't believe you just killed Hamza. Emil gave me no choice. He has to believe I'm on his side. Now I have to convince Williams that you're still on our side. Stay focused, Sam. Don't jeopardize the mission. You can, of course, choose to save Hamza. So I just wanted to mention something real quick. I thought if I saved Hisham, I could plant a body about his size into his SUV and detonate it, which is what Emil wants you to do with Hamza's body to dispose of the evidence anyway. I figured this would play out similarly to version 1, where Hisham gets away, but Emil still thinks he's dead. But oddly, this isn't the case, or at least I couldn't get it to work. So ultimately, I chose to save my fellow agent. Jesus, the eyes! Look at those things! Anyway, the level ends with Sam clearing the courtyard for extraction, and that's that. Version 1 Kinshasa is a bit of a ball breaker, version 2 Kinshasa is a bit of a classic. Stay on this phone and don't hang up for me. I can. I have plenty of energy to drive over there. You understand me? And I will! Alright, so we're back in the JBA headquarters. In version 1, final preparations are underway when SWAT starts to surround the compound. SWAT unit out there at the compound perimeter. Ah, uh, I know why they're here. Keep an eye on them, but don't start anything. All, All personnel. personnel, the, the moment, moment we, we have, have been, been vigilant, vigilant against, against is, is here. here. Emil gives this big speech with his goofy Cajun accent over the PA about it's time to go to battle all Poisonel and all that stuff. But before this kicks off, Sam is faced with the third and final big decision in Splinter Cell Double Agent Version 1. Yep, that's Lambert. And as you may have guessed, Emil wants you to off him. Capping Lambert is actually considered the canon ending, but you know something? Because this happens on camera, the whole base is now aware that Fisher is a traitor, and this sequence is much more difficult as a result. If I had cared one bit about any member of the JBA, this maybe would have caused more internal conflict. If I was friendly with Jamie, if Moss had pulled me out of a tight situation and we grew loyal, if I knew anything about why Emil Dufresne is doing what he's doing, outside of, America is corrupt, I'm gonna cause chaos and start over, which by the way is literally just Doug Shetland's plan done worse, then maybe I would be conflicted about offing them and saving Lambert. But they're one-dimensional, cardboard bad guys, and I feel nothing when crushing them. But, again, whacking Lambert is canon, and you get to move around the base with less restrictions, so... Fuck these bitches! With this choice, you can roam JBA without the usual time limit. You need to scan the eyes of the major JBA members, starting with Enrica. Yeah, remember her? So, if you detonated the bomb in Cozumel, Enrica will be here alive and will help Sam retrieve his gear, as she finally turns against the JBA. But I didn't, so here she is. The Lambert decision is big, loud, and shocking. And I absolutely hate it. Again, with these hollow, empty, water cooler moments like with Sarah and John Hodge. These stupid moments meant to get some quotes like, the most shocking splinter cell yet, and all that tripe on the back of the box. I have to say, it is satisfying going through JBA with the ability to now crack these rats on their head instead of being forced to completely avoid them. From here, it's up to Sam to make it to the underground section of JBA HQ to eliminate Emil and defuse the big red mercury bomb. It's not bad, visually. You can find Jamie and interrogate him, but it's completely underwhelming. From you. If you're looking for the bomb, you're too late. It's gonna blow before those SWAT bastards get inside the walls. Who's saying that? You or Emil? Why don't you find Emil and ask him yourself? It's a real bad time to cop an attitude. You might as well let me go. You're too late anyway. There's no banter between the two at the end of this guy's life? Come on. If you've played Chaos Theory and version 1 of Double Agent, you'll likely notice that Shanghai didn't carry over the precise control animations for Fisher. 
So I was able to find my old Chaos Theory footage from when I talked about the complete control the player has over Sam's movement. Almost every frame of animation can be generated step by step, and when Sam stops mid-stride while crouched, he'll settle into a deep squat as if he was conserving energy. This provides arguably the most important quality a video game can offer, control. In version 1 of Double Agent, the gate cycle control reverts back to that of the first two games, where Sam immediately drops into a low squat as soon as you let off the stick. The delay between animations and chaos theory gave Sam the ability to pivot and move quickly and precisely, as you were, in essence, in the middle of each animation at all times. It may not seem like a big deal, but Double Agent feels awfully clunky in comparison, especially when the FOV gets right up in Sam's model. It's like hitting gas and brake every few seconds. It's especially noticeable after the silky, polished mobility in the third game. It's just an odd step backwards. Literally. <laughs> Any potential nuance of Emile Dufresne is tossed right out of the window in this final section, as he basically just devolves into a stereotypical mad bomber having his loyal scientists wiped out by some armed thugs. Would you? Sure thing. No, don't! Wait, which bullet hit that guy? Oh, never mind. Sam has 10 minutes to defuse the bomb. Kind of cliche, but what can you do? You contend with the crappy camera again. You gotta fight Stipe Miocic here a little bit. Grapple with the camera some more. Take out the blue man group and scan Emil's eye. This leads to the final boss, and no, I'm not joking. You play through the safe cracking minigame, the hacking minigame, and a variation of the freaking mine assembly minigame that was oh so thrilling the first time. If you fail, you have to hack the pad again for whatever reason, and then you get to try the bomb defusal again. Sick. At this point, SWAT breaks into the compound, and this is the end of the level. Depending on if you chose mostly bad decisions of the big three, or your NSA trust is low, Sam will either just disappear or get captured and then escape captivity before vanishing into the next game. If you made good decisions and your trust is high with the NSA, you get a bonus mission. Hold that thought. Version 2 has Sam sneaking into the JBA underground, which is a lot easier to find since it's just a hole that leads underground. Very discreet. So Sam sneaks through Vault 101, dodging lasers and cameras. You get to interrogate Moss again, which is still kind of funny for some reason. I know you're out there. You can't hide. Surprise. Get off, you bastard. Cut to the chase, Moss. What's the timetable? You're too late. It's already happening. I don't like that answer. Tough. The big decision in this version of JBA is, again, nowhere near as dramatic as its version 1 counterpart. Lambert still gets busted by the JBA, as he was posing as their weapons supplier, explaining how Sam gets his usual gadgetry. If Sam confirms Lambert's identity as a federal agent to Emil, Lambert will be whacked, and the suspicion will be taken off of Sam. The strings after you make this decision are a nice audio touch. So, my friend. But like, that's it. This is so dumb, because as I've mentioned already earlier, the mission immediately following has Sam losing all JBA trust anyway, and you're about to ruin their plans with the nukes during this mission. So I'd rather save my good buddy by confirming his story and just finish up my mission here. Again, the big consequence is discussing your choice with Williams in a slideshow cutscene. Really lame and again, likely the result of limited time and budget. But this also directly affects the trust meter, which becomes a pain in the ass in the second half of this mission. The next big choice is one we had already discussed, where you need to defuse three bombs around JBA HQ. When you defuse a bomb, you gain NSA trust, and since my trust was already so high with the NSA after saving Lambert, my trust with JBA is nil, so I have to run back to my bunk to confirm my status with Emil. 
I detailed this once before, so I won't belabor the point, but man, that single trust meter thing is just garbage. The other choice is that you can communicate to Emil's men that the bombs to Nashville and Los Angeles are good to go and just not defuse them. So in this pathway, Sam Fisher is cool with nuking two major United States cities because he had to maintain trust with his villain buddies. Oh, and your consequence for this horrific decision? A slightly altered ending cutscene. We enter programming to bring you a breaking news story. We are receiving reports of massive devastation in Los Angeles, where some sort of explosive device was detonated just moments ago. The destruction is centered on the city's busy port, but the damage extends for miles in all directions. Early speculation indicates that the blast may have been nuclear in nature. The news report shows LA and Nashville getting smoked, and Sam is just off somewhere crying about his almost girlfriend, Enrica. Station! Now, I do like the variety and multitude of decisions in version 2, but there really aren't any overarching consequences or game-changing events that succeed them. They may be limited, but at least in version 1, a few of the big decisions have some gravitas in the truest sense of the word and in the case of saving Hamza in version 1, actually change how a level plays out. In version 2, this usually boils down to Emil or Lambert barking at you and then A.D. Williams chewing you out in a cutscene. For as much as I prefer the overall gameplay of version 2, the choice and consequence single trust meter thing was kinda whack. And really, that sums up the final JBA mission in both versions of Double Agent. A couple of boring levels with one empty hollow moment of shock value between the two of them. Thankfully, there's one last mission apiece. So, I told you how to get the secret bonus mission in version 1. Two out of three good decisions and high trust with the NSA. Carson Moss is in the New York Harbor, just in front of the Statue of Liberty. Sam is wearing a SWAT outfit, no doubt purloined during his escape from JBA. Carson is going to send his bomb right to the city and detonate, unless Sam Alama Ding Dong can stop him first. Think of this like a miniature version of the ship in a Kosk in that it's a frustrating mix of trial and error on a boat. Now, once you figure out what to do, it's pretty simple. Weirdly, this animation, just like in Ellsworth Prison, shows Sam gripping his blade, which he's not. Then there's audio of him dropping it, which he doesn't, but whatever. So, Moss goes down and you defuse the Red Mercury nuke on board. This is another section of frustrating trial and error. SWAT comes to attack the boat, prompting a timer to kick off before they blow it up. But because of this NPC placement randomly being right where I need to go, Sam keeps getting popped as soon as I go to flee. I tried over and over until I realized it was a lost cause and just restarted the level. The second run through it was just fine. Sam floats in the water and to be continued. Dang man, that is a crappy ending. Bonus mission or no, the ending to version 1 of Double Agent stinks. It presents like it got slapped together at the last minute and if this was the version you played back in the day, like I did, the transition from this to conviction didn't make that much sense. At least in version 2, there's an attempt to bridge the gap. Sam and the JBA skydive into New York City in the dead cold of late December. It's quickly established that everyone now knows that Fisher is a traitor, and from this point on, the rest of these men are targets for Sam to eliminate. Wait a minute. She's doesn't deserve this? Um, anyway, to the heart of the matter. I love this level, man. I really do. First of all, New York City in the dead of a blizzard reminds me of Max Payne. Like the old train station, it warms my heart. 
sneaking across the snowy rooftops, through stinky pigeon coops, and eventually inside of a skyscraper, this is all good, man. Despite the age of the engine, the lighting effects against the flurry of snow are beautiful. Also, this version of Jamie's final interrogation is much better than version 1's. Hello, Jamie. Sam! Man, I'm glad I found you. You don't need to do this, Sam. I wasn't gonna kill you. I know Emil has got it wrong. Actually, he doesn't. What? No. I'm afraid so, pal. But... Why? We were friends, man. I'll let you think that. You're lying, Sam. I know you. We bled together, man. You don't know me, Jamie. You never did. See? You're not gonna kill me. Yeah, oh really? Anyway, I love that this heartbroken nerd tries to appeal to his buddy Sam, and being the professional that Sam is, sees right through the routine and lets him know all along that he was just a target. They all were. Or you can just pop the little weasel and hear Sam's quip. What was that noise? Gotcha. So, Sam diffuses a red mercury device and zip lines to the skyscraper. Where are you going, Sam? Wherever Emil is. You know what I have to do. He wants me to shoot you. I don't think I'm gonna do that. So what are you gonna do? No, Sam. The question is, when all this is over, what are we gonna do? Wait, what's all this we stuff? These two characters kinda sort of flirted a few times on missions, and now suddenly they're gonna run away together forever, like Rachel and Deckard? If only this was the extent of the uh, so-called love story, I'd forgive it, but more on that shortly. For this section in the Marku engineering firm, Sam is up against Moss's team of baddies, and they all have night vision goggles. So, much like in the courtyard scene of Pandora Tomorrow, Sam must remain in the light to avoid their detection. Again, it's been done before, but it's still cool here. Especially once you get into this penthouse suite where Moss and his goons are held up. It's a mini sandbox, and I played through this room a couple of times just to try out different methods of attack. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention the sniper attachment for the SC-20K. This thing just shreds, dude. Someone's out there. Well, I sure hope I'm not next. It's obviously anti-stealth, but it's super satisfying to use. Also, Sam is pretty nonchalant about dying in a nuclear blast. Crap. Hello, Moose. Now get it right or pay the price. Fisher. I thought you were anyway, so Sam defeats Moss and crew, and now it's time to work your way to the roof towards Emil. I love the fancy, swanky hotel gardens and the little details like traffic moving along hundreds of feet below. It kind of reminds me of the level in Shanghai. It's a simple effect, but there's something about life carrying on so close yet so far away as this guy is way up here trying to save everyone. Anyway, sorry. Up on the rooftop, click, 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 Emil and Sam have one last verbal confrontation, and then it's on. This final boss fight is just downright fatuous. Emil has what appears to be an M60 and a bunch of laser mines in a grid. You have to move where he moves as he disables the lasers he's closest to so that Sam can pass through. The objective is to get your pistol and smoke him. It's simple once you know what to do, but like Moss's boat in version 1, it took quite a bit of trial and error to kind of nail my pattern. At last, I got it just right, and down he goes. One more bomb to defuse, and with that, Fisher saves the world again. Brace yourself for what comes next. Sam, where are you? Is that you? Enrica, get inside, now! No!
We did good, Sam. Didn't we? In the end? Of course, Enrica. Oh, Sam. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, what? Enrica just blindly wanders out, calling for Sam, and gets capped by another splinter cell sent by Williams. Despite having very minimal interaction with Enrica throughout the game, Sam loses his mind at her demise and starts wailing like a toddler. I do understand why Sam kills the other agent on sight, as he likely realizes that Williams would have sent the agent to kill Sam as well. And as it turns out, if you play the PSP game, Splinter Cell Essentials, Williams was the one who ratted out Lambert and did try to have Sam killed here, as well as altering Sam's records of past missions to frame him as a criminal. So he's a dick. But A, Essentials was utter crap, and the average person trying this wouldn't have played it. B, the way it's framed in Double Agent, Sam is going to exact revenge on Williams for having Enrica killed. Oh well. Even though this version isn't considered canonical, at least there was an ending scene that helps to feed into Splinter Cell Conviction, where Sam is on the run after having gone rogue following the events of Double Agent. Also, if you're curious, this is the scene that plays out when you defuse all of the JBA nukes. We interrupt this programming to bring you a breaking news story. The United States narrowly averted catastrophe today as a three-pronged terrorist assault was foiled. Authorities were able to derail attempts to detonate atomic devices in Nashville, Los Angeles, and Manhattan. The identities of the terrorists are still unknown as no group has stepped forward to claim responsibility for the acts. FBI spokesman Herbert Mangles said today, Several devices, which we believe to be nuclear in nature, were recovered before they could be detonated. Yep, I played through it again just to capture this. And poop again! Well, that's it for Splinter Cell Double Agent. Yes, I know, the multiplayer and the co-op. Well, multiplayer, especially this version of Spies vs. Mercs, is essentially dead. As far as co-op, I want to someday do an entirely separate feature about this, and I think you'll agree that this video has gone on long enough. Brevity is the soul of wit, as they say, and by that measure, my IQ is somewhere around 76. Especially after reading 60 pages in a row, God. So what's the final verdict? Well, I must say that in my opinion, and remember, it is just one man's opinion, I disagree with the notion that version 1 is mediocre or outright terrible. I do understand completely why people say that. It has a lot of crummy parts and some frustrating trial and error, to be sure. But if Double Agent had come out directly after Pandora Tomorrow, I think it would have been received much better than it was. But the problem is, it came out after Chaos Theory. Due to its audiovisual presentation, which was cutting edge at the time, and the incredible gameplay, Sam Fisher was, for a brief time, up there with the Zeldas, Marios, Resident Evils, and Metal Gears of the day. The problem with Double Agent is that it took a step off that ledge and back down into the more common bin of gaming. Not that this is a bad thing in general, but it was when the series started to slip and every fan knew it. It's not bad as a singular experience, but it's just not able to compete with its predecessor. Be that as it may, I do have love for Double Agent. But out of the original quadrilogy of Splinter Cell games is my least favorite. That's version one anyway. This was my first time playing version two. And as I said, for years, I always just assumed that it was the bastard son of the sexy next-gen version. But I was pleasantly surprised at how much I enjoyed this game. 
I wouldn't necessarily call it Chaos Theory 2, as it does strip back some of what made Chaos Theory brilliant, in particular the more open-ended level design, but I would happily refer to it as Chaos Theory 1.5. Some of the levels in this game are classics. Some of them, like the ship in Akosk, pretty much suck. But the expanded and darker Ellsworth prison, the hotel in Kinshasa, and the snowy rooftops of New York City. These all stick out to me. Additionally, I like how more of the story elements were fleshed out, and in the case of Sam learning about Sarah's death, were much more sensical. Overall, version 2 is a solid follow-up to a masterpiece, and absolutely worth seeking out if you enjoyed Chaos Theory. As I said at the start, Splinter Cell is the franchise that I used to lay the foundation of this channel, and I'm so glad I finally got to return to the series and pay my respects. I'll talk about Conviction and Blacklist eventually, but before that I might take a look back and redo a few old reviews with a higher level of polish. For now, if you've made it this far, I just want to say thank you. Also, it's pronounced nuclear.